Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the CGSR lecture series here at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. My name is Asmara Askedom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center for Global Security Research. Today's lecture is entitled Lessons Learned from Europe's Energy Crisis, and our speaker is Professor Brenda Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer is a well-known international energy and foreign policy specialist. She's a faculty member at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, a senior advisor for energy at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global, Center, Global Energy Center in Washington, D.C. She's covering an important topic today. Over the past year, the European energy crisis has resulted in record high electricity prices, placing immense pressure on households and businesses and causing some factories to even shut down. But even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, Europe's energy sector was struggling and electricity prices more than tripled in the second half of 2021. So Dr. Schaefer will explain um, these issues and help us to understand European energy planning and what lessons the United States can learn from its key ally. She will present for about 30 to 45 minutes and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. Uh, so Professor Schaefer, welcome to CGSR. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day and I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to have the dis question and discussions uh, with your group. Um, so, you know, the world is experiencing the worst energy crisis since uh, World War II, and it's especially uh, especially difficult crisis in, in Europe itself. Um, most Western policymakers, including our current administration and, and, and in Europe, uh, place the blame on, you know, Putin. This was due to the, the war in Ukraine and Putin's price hike. But in the reality, um, we've had two years of energy crisis in, in Europe, um, e e winter 2020, winter 2021, uh, 2021. Um, you know, m m even the second crisis months before the, the Ukraine-centered crisis. Um, and and these an indication of how these this energy crisis in Europe had global impact again prior to the war was that um, high gas natural gas prices in Europe led to the closure of many many fertilizer factories in the UK and, and Europe um, and that already caused food prices to rise um, throughout the world so already created a food crisis before the Ukraine invasion so again all this the grain crisis of course it it worsened a bad situation but the fundamentals of it was set uh, in, in Europe itself and um, this is not just an energy crisis. Um, Europe is the largest, I mean, energy is the largest traded good in the global economy. Um, energy is the largest um, price input into manufacturing. So if you don't get energy right, you don't get anything right. And, and this is, and again, like an, has triggered an all out economic crisis. Um, well, part of the problem with the EU energy policies, I believe is that for about 20 years, they've been based on very faulty paradigms. So the first one was that the first paradigm was just liberalize it, take the state out of energy, um, you know, open things up, um, and the market will bring energy security. Well, clearly that had its you know problems because if you just go for the cheapest price of gas and you don't diversify, you end up you know being reliant on one source, which was the case of many countries you know in terms of Russia. So yes. Russia took the actions that worsened the energy crisis, but setting themselves up for ha not having, you know, diversified suppliers or having gas storage, you know, al allowed this geopolitical uh, instrument to be used. Um, a second paradigm was that renewables bring energy security. So we have this from about 2015 in Europe, and that something that renewables are somehow they're local. Um, and that, uh, um, and, and, and that, uh, th therefore, you don't need foreign foreign energy sources. And, and again, the idea that you don't have a geopolitical challenge from how you use energy. But of course, that paradigm ignored the fact that 
today's generation of renewables, one cannot deliver the energy that's necessary for modern economy, especially industrialized economies like Germany, Italy, and France. And second, that today's generation of renewables works on a base load of a, of, of a stable source of energy. I mean, you know, so you cannot deliver renewables as electricity on, a, on an industrial scale if you don't have either nuclear, coal, or gas, right? So the new coal closing, you know, almost almost eliminated not, not eliminated in Europe but a lot closed down in Europe nuclear in a process of being closed down and you don't commission enough gas um, to, to, to service your base load um, and I would say we could add to the sort of renewables paradigm that you know that renewables will solve all the energy security problems it's this idea that we're in an, we are in an energy transition and I would say that Europe and the current and, and US officials today um, present the energy transition as a fact as if it, we're on this as if we're like on this train and it's going towards an energy transition or we're already the train is going through tunnels that are already energy transition despite the fact that 84 percent of global energy consumption is provided by fossil fuels 75 percent of of us uh, energy consumption is uh, provided by fossil fuels and if at anything you know we're seeing a return um, to use of, of dirtier fossil fuels like coal that we thought that we were, you know, at least reducing, um, you know, th their use and e even, even that uh, isn't, isn't happening. So, so uh, other reasons, so the faulty paradigms, another problem was that energy policies became just a subset of climate policy. So it's, it's, it, it just became something, a, a tool or, 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 or a system that you want to change in order to meet you know, your, your climate goals um, versus talking about energy itself. And if you think about almost any conference we have on energy security, energy systems, energy policies, they've become about half conferences on climate and, you know, and not, and, and I think much of the public dialogue about energy security is, is, is really um, gotten. So over the, over the past uh, 10 years, the, the EU um, decided that in order to encourage more renewables, they would essentially um, deny the market more gas, natural gas. Um, and they thought, well, if we don't have all this natural gas coming into Europe, this will create demand for renewables. It will make room for renewables. It was something that was pr pretty good in theory, but but not, not at all in practice. So one, as I pointed out before, it created this non-diversification of the, the market, reliance on, on, on too many markets reliant on Russia. Two, as I pointed out, the, it doesn't take care of your, your base load of your fuel. And this is the thing that we really need to th you know, rethink, I think, in the rhetoric in the United States as well, that it's not renewables or fossil fuels, but it's renewables and a base load that's primarily, if it's in the United States or if we want to, you know, clean base load, which would be on that natural gas, right? So these, they go hand in hand. They're not a binary of, of fossil fuels or, or renewables. Um, and so how did, how did Europe do this? So over the past, you know, how did they try to create more room for renewables by blocking gas? Um, they created impediments to long-term contracts. Um, and, and, uh, the, and, and again, this policy backfired and just meant that despite the fact that Europe borders some of the biggest gas reservoirs in the world, you know, almost in every uh, direction towards the Caspian, towards Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, um, North, North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, um, you know, the, the Europe didn't shepherd in many of these gas supplies um, because it was hoping instead, if, if it sort of dries up of gas, that they will create more demand uh, for, 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 for uh, renewables. But what we see from looking at winter 2020, winter 2021, and the current phase of the crisis, winter 2022, is that if you don't have enough gas, you use coal and fuel oil. It, you don't pull out a wind tower out of, you know, out of the hat. It, 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 it doesn't happen. So if you have sort of an extreme climate policy and you block natural gas, the, the cleanness of the fossil fuels with very little Air, air, um, air, air pollution impact. Uh, you don't end up with more renewables. You end up with more uh, uh, coal. Uh, almost counterintuitively, it's easier now for Europe to consume coal politically, public, publicly than it is for natural gas because. 
coal happens without long-term um, um, contracts. It could come on, you know, arrive into Europe on existing infrastructure, existing fuel uh, power plants, where natural gas is more complicated. Its transportation, its storage requires, you know, longer-term contracts, um, uh, dedicated infrastructure, and so it's those decisions, you know, on the infrastructure, on the storage facilities that get blocked by sort of a public agenda where so so in the end it's easier to open a power you know a, reopen a, a coal fire plant today in europe than possibly than getting gas you know cleaner fuel for 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 uh, your your uh, your uh, power plant well ha okay obviously before the crisis yeah that when when it was sort of small or smaller energy crises in Europe, um, you know, the, the steps weren't taken to prevent this full blown one, but you would think now that this has happened, um, are we seeing really the necessary steps being taken in Europe to, you know, to avoid this crisis, to come out of the crisis? So I would say no, I would say that Europe, um, even though uh, uh, maybe it had a mild winter this year and it seems like things are fine, I, I don't think things are so fine. So one is contract length, they really have not, um, they have really not solved this issue where they're allowing or even encouraging their, their gas buyers and utilities uh, to engage in long-term contracts. And you see that China, for instance, is buying Europe's, you know, is eating Europe's lunch in this sphere where, where uh, much of the U.S. produced LNG is being purchased by long term contracts by Chinese buyers, and they're going to be in the position to sell this gas to Europe actually in the future, right? So the, uh, the producers, you know, want the long term contracts, they're getting, you know, there's no sort of impediment to give it to, you know, whoever is the, is the buyer. Um, and uh, uh, if you, you should notice that, you know, if you if you follow the issues with with the gas that China is engaged in these long term contracts and will be in the end, you know, a gas seller uh, to Europe in the future. Um, Second, even though European officials are going around to different countries, Azerbaijan, Israel, Egypt, um, you know, asking them for more gas, signing memoranda of understanding, you know, non-binding agreements, what they really need is real contracts. And, and so all these more political agreements that say, hey, send gas to us. Yes, we'd like to try to do it. Um, they're not meaningful like true contracts. And we see this with US LNG too. You know, the, the White House, um, you know, signed with the EU officials a, a, a commitment to, you know, increase exports to Europe. But the White, you know, the White House doesn't decide where the gas buyers, well, gas sellers, you know, that are producing the LNG in the United States, where they'll sell it. And in the end, it's going to the highest bidders with the long, uh, long contracts. Um, and third issue is public finance. So Europe has blocked um, all public finance for fossil fuels. So um, even in places where it wants to buy, it wants to buy gas from them, it doesn't want to provide finance to help these countries uh, shepherd that gas into Europe. And even larger and even more of a moral issue, you know, in the developing world, especially in Africa, where they want to develop local natural gas resources, you know, Europe is denying any finance um, to these projects. So it's not doing enough to create a larger pool of uh, supplies. Um, another point is that um, it, in its future plans, and I can say this is the same for the United States, it's resting on very untried technologies that we really don't know how they will perform and what will be you know, their price. So one is uh, high, green hydrogen, um, the next is uh, small modular nuclear reactors that that all these things, while in theory, might solve many problems, uh, since we know from our experience when you haven't built one or you haven't, you know, we know for sure green hydrogen is, isn't, you know, isn't commercial in any sense right now. Um, we have no reason to think it, it will turn, you know, turn commercial. So bas basic, basically basing your, um, basing your policies on, you know, untried technologies that we have no idea what their, their real price will be. Um, one of the results of the current energy crisis in Europe is that it's led to almost a renationalization of many utilities. So many utilities went bankrupt with the with the high um, gas supply uh, prices, um, and obviously you have to have utilities. You have to have provision of uh, of electricity and gas to public, so that 
in some in place, some places the governments have outright nationalized them, in other places they hold uh, governments hold a, a controlling chair, and and this is a complete change over you know decades of decades of liberalization of of privatization of utilities. Now that now they're actually in Europe going back to government hands. Um, so what are the lessons for the United States from this crisis in Europe? Um, one is that you 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 can't avoid engaging in the geopolitics of energy, right? So just saying the market will do it, or if we create rules and regulations, um, but you know if there's there's a lot of there's a lot you know in in most places free market does do the job. Energy is very specific. Energy security is like national security, and just like you can't just privatize the military and, and sort of look at it from a cost benefit analysis, right? Because you need a certain level of security regardless of the you know, the financial costs. Energy security is pretty you know pretty similar. Um, despite that, we don't see really any fundamental change in U.S. policy towards energy security. So if you look at the recently released uh, U.S. national security strategy, it mentions energy 50 times, but half of those times are in the combination of clean energy, energy transition, renewable energy, rather than the energy that we're using today, that, that is the reality. The strategy doesn't mention natural gas even once, even though natural gas is the most uh, maybe problematic element of, you know, you need state involvement in, in energy security. All mentions of fossil fuels are in the negative. Again, even though the 75% of U.S. energy consumption is from fossil fuels. The U.S. military relies on fossil fuels, and the U.S. is the world's largest producer, producer of oil and natural gas. So you're saying that one of the most, you know, productive U.S. industries where the U.S. leads oil and natural gas, you're, you're describing it all uh, in the negative um, in the national security strategy. And even the U.S. national defense strategy um, uh, relates to energy mostly in the context of renewable energy, low carbon energy, and how to reduce energy consumption, but not talking about how we make sure um, that the military has what we call operational energy needs met, the, the needs, you know, it needs to fulfill its, its missions. Um, there's also huge geopolitical problems created by uh, transfer from uh, fossil fuels to predominant to the current generation of renewables, predominantly uh, wind, wind and solar. Um, you know, one, we're going from a system where the United States leads to a system where China leads. Um, and with all the with all what's connected to that um, by Europe and the United States pulling out from public finance. Uh, well, a lot of countries around the world are not going to give up having energy supplies. China will fill in the gap with the with the with the public finance um, and and reap all the benefits. You know, it, it, this won't change anything in terms of climate and uh, environment by by uh, allow by having China provide the public finance versus Europe and the United States, but China will reap all the national security uh, or or national security benefits from having those ties with these countries. Um, I mean, we the United States for for decades. Um, has been really involved um, in the development of infrastructure projects, production projects around the world that highly, um, highly increase global energy security, um, European energy security, um, and you know I think one of the flagship projects of the U.S. government over you know over decades, bipartisan you know Republican and Democrat uh, administrations. Um, by bipartisan uh, work in Congress has been bringing the Caspian resources from Azerbaijan through Georgia and Turkey uh, into Europe, you know, a series of, of pipeline projects. This could not have happened without the United States. Um, and, and, the, and, and those markets were like, for instance, the gas from Azerbaijan, Southern Gas Corridor reached uh, Europe. Those markets are faring much better in this current crisis than those that don't have the diversified sources of gas. But by current U.S. policy, we've actually shrunken our toolbox and said, like, no, there's a there's a regulation from the White House from December 2021, guide, energy engagement guidance that basically says every you know every uh, 
office throughout the government cannot be engaged in promotion in any way of fossil fuels, including you know, the cleanest fuel, nat natural gas, meaning that we can't help ourselves and our allies you know, with these infrastructure projects with, with increasing, you know, increasing supplies. We really need to, th need to think about that. You know, what, it, what does this um, uh, mean? Um, I think and also in an in a overall <clears throat> paradigm of thinking, um, both the United States and Europe have not changed their approach and they're still doubling down that renewables is the way to solve the energy uh, entirety of energy security problems. Renewables might solve certain problems, <clears throat> but first thing, renewables have their own geopolitics, maybe even worse than fossil fuels, again, because <clears throat> because the US is the largest producer of natural gas and oil in the world. They have their own price volatility, which we often ignore. And again, we still need a baseload fuel in order to provide uh, stable elect electricity. Um, we also need to stop assuming that we are, or, or, or I could say not, not, not to give a policy advice, but we, we, it, it doesn't seem reasonable that we're actually in an energy transition. It, it, energy transition generally has a technological spark um, that that creates something new, right? So if you uh, if you found how you can use coal to generate steam and then generate power, right? So you've you've had an innovation that created the energy transition. We don't have that innovation today. I'd be happy to hear from this group with your background if you think we have had that kind of fundamental uh, innovation change. But I, I, it's hard to see the technological spark that means that we're in a new, you know, a new era. Wind and solar are old. Hydropower is quite old. Um, uh, um, and, and, and none of them, again, alone without fossil fuels can even, you know, can deliver uh, a, a energy. Um, it, for industrial uh, industrial level energy, um, and then we also have to think about how is it that natural gas, which was was seen for decades as the solution, is suddenly seen as the enemy. Like that, we don't we don't we've somehow we put all fossil fuels in one basket in terms of policy, and natural gas has done wonders to lower pollution around the world, air pollution. Um, it's helped the United States dramatically lower its carbon emissions um, and to sort of throw that away until we have something else that completely has, you know, zero emissions. Um, if we look at the case of Europe, it's not that uh, if we so if we suppress use of natural gas, it's not like we're going to suddenly move over um, into a, you know, low carbon, um, non air polluting um, source, but we'll probably just move over to coal, uh, you know, some markets potentially uh, nuclear, um, but but uh, it, it won't achieve the, res you know, it, it will likely be counter uh, counterproductive. That's what we're seeing in Europe. If you don't provide enough for, for natural gas, you end up with more coal. So exactly the opposite of your climate and, and environment goals. So I think I'll stop here. I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments.